Hey everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Uh, I'm rather blessed to be sitting here with Mr. Bob Clearmountain. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for having us over to Mix This. So you're from Connecticut? Connecticut, Greenwich, Connecticut, and from, believe it or not, there's another side of the tracks to Greenwich. It's, my parents weren't rich. Right. <laughs> you know, my dad wasn't a CEO of a company. He was just a, an accountant or something. And, and um, you know, although, you know, it wasn't bad. I mean, Greenwich is a pretty nice place to grow up, I must admit. You know, there's a nice beach and Lovely. It's, it's beautiful. But, uh, and I was in, in little bands as a teenager, we had these bands, and, and as I got older, we, we started having gigs in the local bars. Porchester, New York was right over the border, and the drinking age was still 18 over there, where it was 21 in Connecticut. Oh, okay. So we'd go and do gigs in these little little bars over in, in, uh, in, the, in New York, and I mean, we sucked, basically. We were pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I liked playing bass. I hated being in standing up on a stage. A little bar was fine because you're not really on a stage, you know. And when it started getting bigger where you were, there's lights in the stage, I started thinking, man, I don't think this is for me. Plus um, other band members, like the last band I was in, the, the guitar player was, um, was messing around with the lead singer's girlfriend and oh. kind of, then he, he quit and I was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I've had it with this. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm going to get a real job. Yep. So believe it or not, I found one in a recording studio. <laughs> well, how how do you how did you get into that? I mean, well, it's the the lot, that band was doing a demo at a studio called Media Sound in New York, which isn't there anymore. And um, the band split up while we were doing that, and I made friends with the people at the studio, and I got to know the engineer that we were working with, who was also writing songs of the lead singer, which is why we were there. Um, he introduced me to the, the man, studio manager, and I told her, uh, this incredible woman named Susan Planer, she was just a wonderful person and just a great studio manager. And, and I said, you know, I really think I'm going to be good at this someday. I mean, you should, you should hire me because <laughs> I, I, I totally get this. I said, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And I kept bugging her. I kept coming back like week after week until finally she said, all right, we'll come back in September and we'll probably have a, something for you to do. You'll be a runner for a while. Okay, great. So I came back in September. They were, uh, some interns were just going back to school. And so there, were, there was an opening. I went out and did a delivery. I came back and the receptionist says, uh, you that Clear Mountain kid? Oh man, they're looking for you upstairs. You better get up there. And I'm thinking, oh, I screwed up already. <laughs> I've been here an hour. And uh, where have you been? Well, I went out on delivery. Oh no, we don't need runners. We need an assistant engineer. Get down to Studio A. Okay, well, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to take three years. And boy, the times are different back then. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. should understand that's watching this that that doesn't happen anymore. I was really lucky. Right place, right time. But anyway, I walk into Studio A and it's a Duke Ellington session. Oh, incredible. And uh, yeah, it was incredible. It was, it blew my mind completely, of course. And then it, it went on from there and I did, I got it. I got everything right away. Within a few months I was doing, I did a session with Cool and the Gang and mixed a couple of songs. And, and, um, and then six months later, I was on another Cool and the Gang session. I was the assistant and uh, the engineer, who was Tony Bon Jovi, of course, John's cousin, um, didn't show up. And we we're starting their next album and doing basic tracks of the full band. I had set the whole thing up and Tony's not there and the band's like out there more, you know, rehearsing. And so I said, well, somebody better do something. So I started getting sounds. I'd never done it before. <laughs> and even though I had done one mix before, but, um, and Ron, um, uh, Ron Bell, who was the leader of the band, um, who was the nicest guy in the world, he, he was so nice to me. And uh, he came in and he said, yeah, where's Tony? And I go, yeah, I don't know, he didn't show. Okay, well, what do you got? Did you, let's see, and we, they had done one take. Let me listen to what you have. And he goes, yeah, man, sounds great. 
We continued from there. We recorded two songs, Hollywood Swingin' and Funky Stuff. And uh, Hollywood Swingin' was like number six in Billboard. I didn't get to mix it, but um, still it was pretty, and, and I never even got a credit on an album. And they've credited me since then. But right. back then, when the record came out, they forgot who I was. They didn't even remember. And, um, but I was still grateful that I was able to do it. Sorry about that, that's the, that's the front door. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that, and that, that's how it started, basically. That's amazing. Yeah, it was, I was, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, you know, right place, right time. Right, but you also had to be ready for it. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. I was, and I was, I mean, I, I can't really do much of anything. I can do some electrical work, I do my own electrical work, but that's about it. <laughs> Maybe real basic carpentry, but other than that, this is it. And I can't cook, I can't <laughs> <laughs> do much of anything, but I can, I think I can do this, okay. You can do this amazingly well, yeah. So how, um, so what was sort of the journey from there? I mean, basically it sounds like you were probably working 12, 15 hour days. Yeah, but well, media sound did mostly jingles in the yep. daytime and like music for Sesame Street and things mm -hmm. like that. And you had to be really quick. I learned how to just edit really quickly on quarter inch tape and set things up and break things down and get sounds really fast. Because you had to, that's the only way you could do it. If you were slow, you were forget about it in mm. your history. Um, and um, but at night, they were doing things like they were doing R and B records. Mm. They, were, they were big into in the early in, in disco. Uh, Tony did uh, Gloria Gaynor's version of Never Could Say Goodbye, and uh, I think I probably assisted on that. I can't really remember, but. Um, so at night, while well, these R and B records were done, Stevie Wonder was recording Intervisions, oh. and I made friends with the the producers, and they let me hang out and get them coffee and stuff. So I'd work all day long doing jingles, assisting for jingles, and then I'd I'd hang out on Stevie's sessions at night right. for for a while, and just watch. Watching him was one of the most amazing things, and uh, and then I I started in. A lot of, they really pushed me into doing stuff at that studio. It was great. I was a staff guy. Before I knew it, I was, um, you know, mixing Benny King and um, a lot, just a lot of people that I don't even remember, to be honest. But uh, some, some good records. Sister Sledge's first, I think it was their, their first record. Oh, before wow. Before the, 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 you know, the big We Are Family, which of course I did later at Power Station. Amazing. Yeah. And, uh, I used to play that in a, in a band. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. yeah well, Nile Rogers it. and Bernard Edward. Oh, oh it's amazing stuff. Well, those are the early days of Power Station. They were our first client when we first built Power Station. Wow. And um, we did the Chic Records and, and Sister Sledge and a, and a bunch of other things that they produced. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I remember La Freak. I just remember right. that first came out. Wow, what, a, what an infectious song it was. Right, yeah. Yeah. And they were everywhere. I mean, how many artists were there? They had all these, they were different, but it was the same rhythm section. The same, same rhythm section. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, the um, La Freak album and the We Are Family mm -hmm. Sister Sledge album was all, all the same people. Mm -hmm. And we cut both those, the, the basic tracks for both those records, the same four nights in a row. Wow. Right? And I didn't know which song was going to be on which record. And then they spent, you know, like a month or two doing vocals and things like that but uh yeah so it's amazing what they came up with incredible yeah, and the and the singers were um luther vandross was one of the chic singers yep which i don't know how many people realize that and there's a guy named david lasley and then there there's their singers fonzie thornton and um uh lucy i forgot her last name <laughs> it's a long time ago <laughs> Those are incredible records, um, absolutely amazing records. I'm, 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 see, now I'm remembering on the days when I first heard those. Mm -hmm. And it was so uniquely, to us in England at least, or in the UK, uniquely New York and America. Mm. That, just that super dry drum sound, mm. that, the, the bass line. See, I'm getting all geeky. I just want to know if there's anything you can remember about recording techniques sure. and stuff like that, because 
Those drum sounds were so like, the snare is, well, had this perfect place that it sat, the kick sat exactly. People used to talk of the folklore of, of the tape being cut to just make sure that all of the beats laid back just right. I heard all these stories. <laughs> oh, we were all obsessed with it. You know yeah, how the folklore goes. Was, yeah. <laughs> no, no, they, that's the way they played. Tony Thompson was an incredible drummer, although he wasn't that great at fills. One, one time I asked Bernard, I said, how come Tony never plays any fills? Because it was mm -hmm. always just really straight. Yep. Have you ever heard Tony play fills? <laughs> <laughs> and it was never in a, a click track or anything mm -hmm. like that. I mean, he had an incredible time, but he wow. would kind of tend to rush his fills. Because uh -huh. later he played with Bowie, and you can hear it on Bowie's right. stuff. Yep. But um, he was great. And not only that, but the drums, speaking of that, there were our drums that, yep. that I bought for, for Power Station. What drums? I, there was Lud it was just a basic Ludwig kit. I always liked the way Ludwig sounded. It's not the best hardware in the world. This stuff kind of breaks, unfortunately. But they always sounded great. They were easy to tune, and I would always tune them. I would go and come in before the session, and I'd get in there early, and I'd go through and I'd tune them. I'd tune the snare drum, and, um, and then I'd take the key. <laughs> <laughs> Take the drum key so that the drummer couldn't touch Mess it up. <laughs> and then I'd go out between takes and touch them up. And and because uh, I was just into that back then. There, there weren't like drum techs back then like mm -hmm. there are now. And so now you don't really have to do that. But back then, the, the drummers were so worried about what they were playing that they weren't they weren't thinking about the sound of the drums that much, I guess. I don't right. know. But I was always kind of somewhat fanatical about it. And um, so that, it was all on analog tape, which I think it would be better if it was on digital, <laughs> but there wasn't any digital. <laughs> That's an interesting perspective, I like that. Yeah. Yep. Well, there were times, especially with Chic, when I was only the only one in the control room, the band is producing, so they're out in the, mm -hmm. in the studio, and they do a take, and I'm like, man, this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard. And then they come and play back off the tape, and I go, well, it still sounds great, but it's a little, it's like once removed. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not as present. Mm -hmm. it, it's lost, it's always, I always felt that it lost something, especially with the drums. Not so much guitars, the guitars always sounded great, you know, no matter what, and keyboards and things like that. Although piano, I thought always sounded better, not having it be submit, you know, not, not going through the analog tape phase. But uh, just in general, you know, there was this little, a little bit blank of blanket of noise, you know. Yep. It's interesting. Tim Palmer said that. I did a panel with him a few years ago, and he said the same thing. Really? Yep. No, I, most people yep. vehemently disagree with me. <laughs> well, it, it, somebody asked a question, and there was about five of us on this panel, and uh, everybody had an opinion. And Tim's like, no, I hate it. I hate the fact that I get a great guitar sound up, and then I play it back, and all the high end are gone. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's the thing. <laughs> And depending on what kind of tape you use too, and whether it was the right batch or not. I did some projects in Australia and we had to start a week later because we couldn't find tape that sounded good. Right. <laughs> you know? And then Tom, Tommy Vicari said to me that uh, in his perspective, uh, when people moved over to digital, they stepped, kept thinking it was like tape. So he said they would, always hit it super hard with oh, high end. Yeah, right. And then they come back in digital and go, oh, it sounds so harsh. It's all crunchy. And, he, and he's like, stop thinking like tape. Right. And so. what's, what's funny is that people that are used to recording on digital have trouble recording on analog. Because right. I'll get things that, you know, people go, oh, we recorded this analog. Yeah, great, except there's no top end. Do, yep. do you realize when you're recording on analog, you have to kind of EQ to the tape. Yep. Because yep. otherwise, you're just going to lose it. It's not. It's going to sound terrible when it comes back. And I presume as well they're probably printing signal which is about this loud. When the well, that's the thing. They're not printing loud. They don't understand l levels. You know, drums you got to print fairly quietly because you're not on, on these meters. You're not seeing. Yeah. You're not really seeing the peak level. Yeah. And then, um, you know, in the bass, you you know, you, it's just it's really different. It's just. Yep. It's, it, there's an art to recording on analog that I think a lot of people nowadays, especially you get these real analog freaks that didn't go through that, that just think that it's, oh, you just, you just record flat on analog and it's fine. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, by the way, who owned the studio, Media Sound? Media Sound was, well, it was built by uh, Joel Roseman and John Roberts, the guys that financed Woodstock. Ah, okay. Right, and um, I don't think it had anything to do with Woodstock. It's just they were these couple of rich guys with money, and uh, so so they financed the building of it. it. I mean, they had real cheap equipment. It wasn't great gear, mm -hmm. although they had a lot of Pultex and things like that, which were great, and so that was nice. But the consoles were horrible. You know, there was really... In fact, I remember <laughs> coming in, the first thing I would do... I w the Pultex were all in, in bo boxes, outboard boxes. Yeah. And it's, there were two, three floors of studios, two floors, right? two floors. And so they were sc scattered all over the place. So I'd come in really early and gather them all up and bring them in and pile them up in my room. Right. You know, if I was doing a session. And then the console, I would put everything at 10K and turn, them, turn all the knobs full up at 10K, right? Just to get, just to make it sound normal. <laughs> right. And then I'd plug in Pultex to actually get some sounds. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they yeah. were just really dark sounding consoles. Do you remember who, what consoles yeah, they were? It was a Spectrasonics, but they were basically homemade. Right. You know, right. the guy that built the place was just got a real deal on them. And right. There was a, they had to wire all these transformers in the thing to, to get it to not hum. And <laughs> they weren't right. good. They finally got Neves, which were great. You know, when that happened, everything changed. It was, and of course, then I left. <laughs> and where did you go to? <laughs> to Power Station. We Power built, Station. Yeah, Tony came to me and said he had made money off Gloria Gaynor and, and Disco Star Wars and all these funny projects. But he, he had done pretty well. He said, look, I made some money. I'm going to build my own studio. Do you want to be, do you want to be in or work, work there? He didn't want me as partner. He just right, wanted me right. to, to be kind of the, the, the head engineer guy. I said, yeah, sure. And so I helped, you know, we went searching for buildings. We found the, the, the 53rd Street location. And, and I remember that day I walked into this building and it was an old TV studio. They used to sh shoot a show called Let's Make a Deal in there. And uh, so it was a huge sound stage. And I go, well, this ought to work pretty well. And then I found this door that led to a, an extra stairway, like an auxiliary stairway. And I went, what's this? And I clapped my hands and it just went Psh. And I was like, oh man, this is the place. And we wired that up to, that became our chamber one, our main echo chamber. Oh, fantastic. Which unfortunately the fire department came and quashed that a number of years later. And but you got to use it on a bunch of records? Yeah, I did, yeah. You know, you can really hear it on, on Avalon in particular, for Roxy Music. On, uh, if you listen to the song, um, Heaven for Brian Adams, all the the, drum, the crazy drums, that's all that chamber. Oh, it is? Yeah. And a bunch of other things. I mean, it was on lots of, and all of the big ballad things, you know. Well, I definitely want to get into those records, but I'm, 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 I'm really enjoying the chronological order of your oh. career. So, so what was, you know, um, this is like a fan question. What was like the record for you, when did you transition to like become more of a mixer? Um, hard to say. I think, I mean, Chic was a big deal because we had done um, lots of dance mixes, extended versions, mm -hmm. and that was the thing back then. I mean, the equivalent now is remixes that people sure. do. But back then, we didn't add instruments. We just took what was there mm -hmm. and we'd loop a section and we'd, we'd make them longer so the people on the dance floor could dance for eight minutes or t nine minutes. And there were big instrumental sections and we'd do breakdowns right. down to percussion, things like that, yep. you know? It was pretty, pretty basic. And um, so I'd done, you know, we'd done some of those for Chic, and plus Chic had the, the biggest single, the biggest selling single Atlantic Records had ever had up to that time, I think. It was, I think it was Lafreak. Either Lafreak or Good Times. I can't remember which one. But um, so the Rolling Stones were, they, they had their Rolling Stones records, but it was through Atlantic. And so a really clever A&R guy over there, they were looking to, they had done a song called Miss You. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, yeah, we're looking for like a dance, like a 12-inch dance mix of this. Oh, get this guy Clear Mountain because he's, he's, he's doing the thing. 
And so I did that, and Mick loved it. And then he said, well, we'll do the single version too. Redo the single version. Okay. And uh, I got to meet him and work with him. And uh, I think it kind of started there. And, of course, then, um, well, there was Chic, which were huge, and there was that. Um, I was producing Brian Adams, mm -hmm. and that became really big. I co-produced four albums for him. There was you, you Want It, You Got It, which is a terrible name for a record. <laughs> it was a terrible album cover. And then um, Cuts Like a Knife. Cuts Like a Knife was... Right? Oh, yeah. Re Reckless and Into the Fire. And then I mixed pretty much everything up until a few years ago for him. And, um, and we're still best friends. That's great. You know, I hardly see him ever, but <laughs> yep. we're still really good I mean, friends. he was so huge in the UK. Yeah, That's yeah. So well, I think he's yeah. underrated, you know. Um, he's just an amazing singer. He's a great mm -hmm. performer, if mm -hmm. you've ever seen him live. Yeah, I have, yeah. yeah. He puts on a fantastic show. Yeah. And he's a really good guy. He's a real philanthropist. I can't even say it, philanthropist. Mm -hmm. he, he, he doesn't talk about it at all to anybody, but he supports all kinds of great causes and charities. And you know, I remember being in Vancouver because we did a lot of his records in Vancouver where he lived. And he was giving me a ride to the airport one time because I was heading back to New York. And you know, the Chinese had come in and they were tearing their old all the old architecture down and putting up these big glass and steel towers. And there was this one old, this beautiful old building that they were just starting to demo. And we stopped on the way to the airport. He goes, oh, look at this. And he stopped and he went out and started yelling at these guys. He said, you gotta stop, you, you can't tear this down. What are you doing, what are you doing? It's like a real fanatic about that kind of thing. And they're like, Brian Adams is shouting at me. They would know exactly who he is. Yeah. Yeah, that okay, was probably yes, Brian deal. Adams, now just leave us alone, you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. we're getting paid to do this and we don't care what you say. Oh. But yeah, he, he's, a, he's a really amazing person, actually. Yeah, I, I, you know, growing up in England, those records were huge. Yeah, I know. Huge. Yeah, and just like hit after hit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, I can't remember, he has some kind of, we have to look it up, but he has some kind of record for, for top 10 singles in, in the UK. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And, well, Everything I Do, which isn't one that I produce, but um, Mutt Lang did that. And um, it that was, was number one for like nine weeks. Yeah, it was number nine one weeks forever. Or something. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Not only that, but that, that album, he had tr I had started that album and then Steve Lillywhite tried to produce some of it and then finally he did it with Mutt Lang. It took two years cost probably a million and a half dollars. I don't know, it cost a lot of money. Just spent forever on it. Um, well, the single recouped the album costs be before we even finished mixing the album. Because the <laughs> single came out before the album. And we couldn't believe it when we were looking at the, how the record sales. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's like, it was unheard of. It was just insane. It was such a huge hit. Yeah, I know. I remember, I remember the video, I just remember every week, every Thursday night on Top of the Pops, there it was, number <laughs> yeah. one hit, for weeks and yeah. weeks. Yeah. So, um, did, really how, long, how many years did you stay at Power Station? Were you there for? Um, it was about, let's see, it was 77 till about 82, I think, 83, so about five years, maybe. And then what happened is I started doing other projects, like I was, I was producing Hall and & Oates and they wanted to lock the studio out, you know, and they really liked Electric Lady because, um, well, a couple of reasons, because they, you know, Electric Lady would do anything they wanted and uh, downtown and on 8th Street. And that was the other thing is that 8th Street is where they, all the shoe stores are. And uh, Daryl's really into shoes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so at lunchtime, he would always go out and go shoe shopping. <laughs> so he liked it down there. And that was cool. It was a good studio, you know. We, it was fun to work there. And, uh, but the, that, that's when I started working in other studios. I started working at Hit Factory and Right Track and different places where, that were more flexible with hours because Power Station, would, there had a policy, they had a policy that every room had to have two sessions a day, a day session and a night session, right? So there was, there was, three rooms, so there had to be six sessions, you couldn't lock out. What was the thought process of that? Well, I mean, on a business-wise sense, uh, from a business, looking at it business-wise, uh, 
it keeps, um, you always have clients, right? You have more clients that mm -hmm. way. And so there's more things being done there. And uh, which makes sense. The trouble is that you lose big clients that sure. want to lock the room out, like yeah. Paul Notes or other people. Yeah, how you leave everything set up and you want to come in the next morning and... Yeah, it was always this mad dash between mm -hmm. six and eight to change over for the next session, you know, especially with analog tape machines because everybody had their own their own bias setting or their own, you know, is it plus three over 185 or is it plus six? And it was just, a, you know, they'd have to go in and tweak everything. It would, be, it would not be so difficult nowadays because digital is digital. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, but still the setup. It's still the setup is a lot, yeah. yeah. I mean, Springsteen would be set up and they'd have to, they'd have to break down his entire session and he'd record live with drums, guitars, two keyboards, sax, you know, all this stuff. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was difficult. And not only that, but the other thing about Power Station that back then was I had wired up, I found this ladies room in the basement because it was, because it was a TV studio, there were dressing rooms. And so there was a men's room and a ladies room. The ladies room was a little bit bigger and I went in one day, and, I, and I just, once again, clapped my hands and go, oh, this has a kind of a cool sound. It was all dirty and everything. And I, I cleaned it all up. I, I found an old uh, JBL 4311 speaker that nobody was using, stuck it in there, stick a, stuck a couple of, uh, I think, four AKG 451s in there, just like a little XY, mm -hmm. and then started using that as, a, as an echo chamber. And, but the problem was, it was right next to the freight elevator, and we used to park <laughs> the cars on the third floor. Yeah. Right? I parked my car on the third floor. But the, the accountants, the office people, they all parked up there. And so at like 6 o'clock, I'd be just printing a mix using the echo chamber. And, you know, because of all the pipes ran right under the floor, you couldn't use the, the elevator if I'm printing. Yeah. Right. And they'd be knocking on the window. I got to get my car out. You just give me a minute. I've just got to print this. <laughs> it was nuts, you know. <laughs> what, a, what a thing. I mean, nowadays you could just do an impulse response and yeah. not worry about it. Yeah. But um, and and all that's gone now. Of course, they were renovating the whole thing. But um, yeah, those. <laughs> it's funny thinking about those days. Yep. It was fun, though. <laughs> yeah, and, and a completely unique sound. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. listen to the opening of, to Start Me Up. I mean, Start Me Up is pretty much all that at, that bathroom. On that, the guitar tone? Yeah. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, uh, do you hear that, that reverb? Yeah, I hear it. Yeah. In my and head, I can hear it now. Lay, when we get into my plug-in, mm -hmm. I don't have that chamber, but although I'm, I'm trying to get it, because they yeah. did, actually did a real post response, i got to get permission to use it. But we found another bathroom that's almost identical to it. And so, in, fact, in fact, it's a little bit better, I think. Amazing. And so we have it in, in, in my plug-in. That we'll so Tattoo about. You, I mean, that's a... Uh, well, that was an interesting record. That's a big record for me. Oh, yeah? It? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I love that record. Well, that was interesting because they didn't actually record that. You know, it was, it was um, leftover recordings from about eight, you know, between eight and ten years before that. Um, that they just put together and finished up and wrote songs for. And, um, and so a lot of it, it was interesting the way it came in. It was all analog, but some of it was 16 track, some of it was 24 track, some of it was Dolby, some of it was non-Dolby, and nothing was labeled. And so I put the tape up, gee, I wonder what this is, and you could tell if it was 16 track because every third track, would, there wouldn't be anything on it, you know, and uh, on the 24 track head. And of course, it was 24 track. You could there was something on most almost every track, and uh, but f whether it was Dolby or not, you had to just listen to it. Okay, does it sound all hissy and compressed? Well, then it's Dolby. Then we better <laughs> pull, pull out the Dol plug in the Dolbys, and uh, and I think I got most of it right. <laughs> well, I, no, that was the toughest part with that record. I I, I had heard that it was a load of outtake stuff. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know whether they had re-recorded stuff or whether it was original outtakes from it. So. It was original outtakes, but they, they added stuff. They added stuff. Yeah. I mean, you did an amazing job on it because Thanks. it's kind of a, for me, it's like one of the best records. Mm. Because, really? well, I mean, you've got Start Me Up, Waiting on a Friend, mm. you know, even a 
silly song like She's My Little TNA is still like an amazing rocker, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to believe like a song like Start Me Up didn't make the album that it was supposed to be right. on. I, I mean, know. it's such a great song. It's like one of their staples now. But it was a beautiful thing because the record, after Emotional Rescue, which was a great record, yeah. it was a great, great record, was, yeah. but this was like a return because of the, the being an old, older tracks, a return to like the Rolling Stones that everybody wanted. Yeah. But due to the, you mixing it, it sounded like a modern album. Right. So it had the feel of Exile on Main Street. <clears throat> but for me growing up, I love those records and they're amazing, but they sounded older. Yeah. Where this tattoo you sounded of the time. Okay. It had a modern like snappiness to it, mm. but it sounded like classic stones. So well, that's nice. It's that's a very nice important hear. record, I think, for them. Yeah, because I <laughs> see for me, I listen to their older stuff and I prefer it. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, that's just me. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's there's a romanticism, isn't there, of of of, of when we listen to that because. Yeah. We've got that visual of a 19-year-old Mick Jagger, you know, just yeah. kind of doing his thing. And, and Beggar's Banquet, I just think, is probably about the best rock record ever ever made. I just love that record so much, you know, and that that period of, you know, Exile and oh, amazing, some of the yeah. other records during that, that time period with the, the Jimmy Miller produced. Just amazing, amazing songs. Did you carry on working with the Stones after that? Uh, yeah, well, on and off, I, I have. I mean, I did. They did a movie after that in the mid '80s, and and there was a live album. So I did that. I read, you know, I went out and recorded them in a bunch of places, and um, and then just more recently here, we did a bunch of uh, outtake records, did, um, outtakes from Exile, and outtakes from Some Girls, I think, that were were Mick wrote songs around, you know, updated these outtakes and added stuff. You know, and um, things like that, and, and and I've mixed so many live concert videos for them, probably forty or fifty concert videos for them over the last fifteen years or so. You know, things that they had recorded that they there were bootlegs of most of this stuff, but they never really remix or, or cut the videos properly. You know, and so they they you can get all that stuff on their website. I think fantastic. So. Let's keep going on that order. I, I definitely want to, to get to sort of the Avalon time. If I, if I say your name to anybody, the first thing that always comes up is Avalon. Mm. And then song-wise, Tears for Fears is Woman in Chains. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I taught you at NAMM this year, I told you about all these mixes, that are friends of mine, that all, that's one of the reference tracks. Mm. There's something about Woman in Chains for so much of us, it's the width of it. Mm -hmm and the depth of it, and also the height of it. The fact that when the- Well, we were all really high when we <laughs> No, just kidding. I mean, I think like Tattoo You, these are records that you listen to now and they sound contemporary. Mm -hmm. And- uh, Right. I, there's, lots, there's lots of things I'd love to know, I mean, from a technical perspective. When I was talking to Jack Joseph Puig yesterday, mm -hmm. he was telling me about MXR Flanger, and oh. he said, oh, I got that from Bob Clearmountain. <laughs> oh, yeah. There they are. There they are. <laughs> he said that, he said that uh, you would send to that before going into a reverb. That's what he said. He I did. probably had done that, maybe. <laughs> I don't really remember that particular one, but yep. sometimes on the output of a reverb. Sometimes. On the output of a reverb, right, right. You know, and just on vocals, on Bowie's vocals sometimes, I'd use those, and... And, and Jagger's vocals on Tattoo well, Bowie you. vocal, being such a huge fan that I am, what Bowie vocals were you using them on? Um, uh, China Girl. Right. Where he goes, he goes, shh, like that, and you hear the shh, 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 yeah. shh. Well, that's a couple of those just things. Just you shut your mouth, yeah. Yeah, yeah just yeah. you shut your mouth. Yeah, and, yeah, and it, yeah. yeah, right, exactly, that's yeah. it. And she um, says, baby, just you shut your mouth, yeah. Yeah. And then when Iggy did it, is Iggy. Iggy says, uh, what's his name, Jimmy, Jimmy, right. shut your mouth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and then on uh, Tattoo You, uh, what's that song? Um, oh, I forgot the name. I'm terrible with names. So that's sorry. okay. You have, you have a lot of songs flying around <laughs> yeah. your head. Yeah. 
But uh, yeah, that's just a, that was actually the the um, the flanger was that the, the um, Fender Rhodes R and B sound of the '70s for me mm. is that you'd get the, the Fender Rhodes and and you'd stick it through that thing and it it turned it into this cool this cool thing you know that all of a sudden you you could hear it because you know, Fender Rhodes kind of blend in you know what I mean they're yeah yeah they, they kind of you don't really hear them for some reason. That's, mm-hmm. um, which can be beautiful thing. sometimes. You well, yeah, it can. Strength on a guitar. But you put it there, and all of a sudden it turns into yeah. an, like a, an identifiable instrument somehow. I don't know. I don't know if that's the, I'm saying it. No, that's, right that's beautifully put. Yeah. How long have you had the console? Since 94. Um, they built it for you. The thing with, with this studio, Mix This, is uh, I didn't know if it would work having a studio in the basement of my house. And so we built it. Um, Basically, this is a big rec room, and you know, put the walls in and everything. I got a really good architect that that turned it into something that worked because it's a square room, so there's a lot of diffusion. And um, and then I rented Sting's gear. She, he's got the studio in the box, and it's a it's an SSL like this. It's smaller than it's a 64 input that folds up into road cases, and it comes with everything else. You can rent it. It had. Um, Racks of gear and tape machines back then, of course, chairs, speakers, everything, and you could you could set the thing up in like forty five minutes, the whole Amazing. thing, <laughs> and uh, it was really pretty well designed by the SSL was pretty well custom designed by Solid Logic, and so we I rented that for six months to see if it would work, and I was it was just nonstop from the the, the first thing we did here was Streets of Philadelphia for Springsteen. Beautiful. And it was a video lockup and everything, which is mm. back then it was a big, much bigger deal than it is now. And um, and so I said, okay, this is working out. So let's, I'm going to buy my own gear. And I bought the, I had they had them make custom make this for me. It's got a bunch of factory mods, and then I've modded it over the years. And um, and that's it. I bought a bunch of stuff. You know, some some people, Brian Adams, gave me a couple of Poltex. I bought some more uh, things like that, <laughs> and off we went. Um, are there? Uh, I see you have a, a four distressors there. Four distressors, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I like those. Any uh, particular favorite things? I love the distressors. Poltex, I've always loved. I mean, I grew up using those, and I'm still using them. Uh, the EQP One A is my fave. Do you have uh, particular places you like them on? Um, piano. <laughs> love Cat wants to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> love my piano. Um, guitars. Yep. Um, that bottom one is actually broken. It's a, it's a solid state one. It doesn't have tubes in it. Ah. And um, I've always liked it on snare drum, and I th- always kind of preferred it over the the other tube ones. And I thought, oh, it's just because it's something about the fact that it's transistors. And so Apogee modeled these for their plug, because they, they've done Pultec plugins. They're af- actually the only authorized uh, Pultec plugins. They can, they're the only ones that can use the name Pultec legally. Um, but then when they did the, the solid state one, they said, you know, this, that's broken. <laughs> and I you're th- like, I said, what? What do you mean it's broken? So yeah, there's something, there's a bad part in there. I don't know if it's a bad transistor. They didn't tell me what it was, but th- it distorts more than it's supposed mm. to, quite a bit more. And I've been using it on snare drum, and it's, it does a thing, I guess. I, I, I seem to gravitate towards it, and it's been working p- pretty nicely for me. That's wonderful. I had no idea there was anything wrong with it, though. So we're going to do a... Actually, we've done a... Apogee's done a, a plug-in that's just... The broken Specifically, one. the broken one. For the sound. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's amazing. I, I, I have the, the remakes that Steve Jackson does of that because... Yeah. Of, the, 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 oh, the, oh, the transistor one? Yeah, transistor one because they, yeah. they have the API 2520. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. He, yeah, we had one at, at, at Apogee for a while. Oh, and those the, Steve's? The, the top two are Steve's, yeah. Isn't he a wonderful guy? He's amazing. Yeah. This guy's brilliant. He's just a total geek, you know? Yeah. And uh, I hope that I'm not... I don't mean to be in... I don't mean that in a bad way. I no, mean no, no. Only in a good the, way. These days, geek, geek and nerd actually is, is a badge of honor these days. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and he spent years and years making sure it, mm-hmm. it was exactly right. And they're, they're virtually identical. 
to the um, to the originals because two of those are originals and I can't tell the difference. Yeah, you know? I agree. And anybody who doesn't know Steve, he's a wonderful human being and One of the nicest guys. Also, we developed Appy developed the the, pol- the plugins with Steve, amazing with his approval. Great, and it's pretty hard to tell tell the difference I can between the plugin and the real thing. I mean that. Totally nailed it. It's amazing how good it is. Well, he told me he became really good friends with Gene, the original designer and yeah, owner, right. and you know got his blessing and and really yeah. worked very hard. Well, that's the whole thing. Real labor just of love. To make, make sure it was totally authentic. Yep. You know? Yeah, yeah, was really beautiful. Um, so uh, other outboard stuff. I, I see uh, um, the SPX ninety at the top. Oh, well, it's a nine ninety yeah. at the top. Uh, yeah, the nine ninety. Which I always thought was strange because they have an SPX one. They made an SPX one thousand, but the ninety nine ninety is better. Right. Why didn't they call this the SPX one thousand and ten? Like, <laughs> why? Why is this less? <laughs> I bet. I, I bet you. I bet it was because the SPX ninety was such a catchphrase. They probably thought. Oh, maybe that. Just, was just it. keep that ninety in there, then people will remember. You but, you're probably right. But I, I, I suppose you just have to get the marketing brain on. It's never the. I know. I it's a bit like when everybody invents a new microphone, they always call it a. They they give it some kind of Neumannish name. Yeah, right. Exactly. The marketing guys like it. Yeah. Can you just say it's a six seven something, <laughs> right. a four seven something? It's funny trying to come up with names for for gear because at Apogee, I get a little involved in that. You yeah. Know? They never use my suggestions, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, because <laughs> probably nobody would agree with me. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I know that th- those Yamaha boxes. Th- this thing, the D five thousand Yamaha delay, yep. is really good too. Except that now I've been through two of them and they've they both broken. That one doesn't work either. <laughs> oh, is that are they current models they make? Or? No, they don't make them. Oh, None so you have to scour any of this stuff anymore. You have to scour the internet to find yeah. them. Yeah, that's actually a U- an eBay one. An eBay one. And, the, and yeah. then there's the Roland there. Yeah, yes, and of course, SDA you can see 3000. this one's dead. The second roll and that's dead. Oh, it is as well. Luckily, I came up with this plugin that does all that. Great. And so that, uh, just in time, because this is the last one, because I went through two of these, these SDEs, unfortunately, because they're great. I mean, they're just so easy to set up and mm-hmm. reliable up until recently. <laughs> I suppose they have a lifespan as just, you know. Yeah, the old stuff, that. That they just go after a while. See some drama gates there? Yeah, well, they, they don't, I think one side of that works. And that's, that's all that's left of that. Uh, ultra and, harmonizer? Um, yeah, that, that works. Yeah. Still. Yeah, my, my, my oh, 3000's this, hanging in there. Both these work. The 3000 and the ultra harmonizer. Yeah. I, I, I'm a big fan of even stuff. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. I love it. I love those guys, Richard Factor and, and Tony uh, Agnello. They're, they're good friends of ours. That's wonderful. Yeah. I, I, I recently did some stuff with them and, and Tony wrote me this really lovely email and, you know, thank you and I appreciate what you said. Because mm. I was a big fan of um, the Omnipressor. Oh, yeah, right. That was a good, cool, fun box. It's just box. this really wrong sounding, yeah. randomizing thing. Yeah, and he wrote right. me this. And I just, I felt like a little kid, yeah. you know, to get this nice email from this guy that I respect so much. It was really, yeah, that's great. It, you know, it's really a lovely feeling. Um, Plus, Jack um, uh, Douglas would tell me about the early days of Eventide in mm-hmm. New York, how they would like bring in stuff that they had been working on and they'd get sure. to try it out. He'd always told me there was a, their flanger, uh, the Insta flanger. Was yeah. He used to use that on a snare drum to just kind of go, boo, boo. Oh, really? To the, I don't know if you ever <laughs> no tried some silly stuff like no, that. No, I never tried that. I was, that sounds like a good... Good trick. I have to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yeah. know those guys like Jack and Shelley and and uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, thanks for indulging all this stuff. I, I love the chronological thing because, quite frankly, you have an insanely good resume. Oh, One of the nice. most. I I I I can't help in my mind, you know, hearing when you're talking about like the Sheik and Benny King and Sister Sledge stuff, just how much of a blessing that was because you're working with some of the finest kind of funk and groove and R&B artists of that period. Not only just great players, but massively successful. Yeah. Like that stuff was huge. And then, because we've always, I, I talk a lot about my, it's my own bias, but what I believe to be a golden age of, of music for us was like mid 70s to like mid 80s. Yeah. Because all bets were off, mm-hmm. genres were irrelevant, 
People would put out albums where it would be like, hey, it's a disco track, it's a 50s kind of rock and roll one, here's more of a rock one. And, and songs were still king. Yeah. Whether it be sure. Michael Jackson or mm -hmm. whoever it was, everybody just had song after song after song. Yeah. You know, um, I, I love, I love like 1980 as, as a very ignored year because it's not a very sexy year because it's not punk rock in England. It's not really, but you know, in 80 alone was, was Off the Wall and Queen the Game and, and uh, The River and uh, Glass Houses mm. and the list goes on. Yeah. Of just like Commodores, like all these records. And they're just like, so I, I love talking to you because that, you're making records around that period and involved right. in so many of those. Um, I think there's a part of me that just wants to know what that energy felt like. You know, what just was what it? was it like to be in there in that moment? Well, it was, it was amazing. I mean, to, you know, at Media Sound, in the early days, I was just happy to be working in a recording studio. I thought, what a great job this is. And I love right. doing this. And I, and I kept learning stuff constantly, you know, and, and learning how to deal with clients and, and, and different types of music. And, and um, I mean, I grew up, I was, a, I was a rocker. I loved listening to Motown records on the radio. I lo always loved that, but I never thought that wasn't really, you know, my main thing was British rock mostly and you know, some American, American rock, of course. Um, I was a big Leon Russell fan, for instance, but that was part of England too, and even though he was from the American South. Um, but um, so, so because Media Sound was mostly R&B records, I got this sort of R&B training, which mixed in with the rock part of me. <laughs> That's a fantastic training. And so it, I think, think it was a really good mm -hmm. thing for me because instead of just, just the you know, screaming vocals and super loud guitars. There was something about the, the drums and the bass that was really important and um, that I always felt was important because of that. And so it was a great, it was a great mixture. I was very lucky that, in that sense, I think. Oh, I, I, I believe it 100%. Charlie Gillett, the writer, talked about how rock got incestuous because rock bands in the 60s listened to blues, and that was amazing. Yeah. But in the 70s, they listened to the late 60s bands, and right. then in the 80s, they listened to 70s bands. Exactly. So anything you can do to go back to classic R&B and funk and blues, it's just, a, I mean, that's where yeah. it sort of really comes from. Right. So I'm sure right. a guy like Mick Jagger probably could see that oh, as well. For sure. Being a huge, obviously. He was a big blues fan, yeah. yeah. I mean, those guys were totally into American blues more mm -hmm. than anything. You know, it's so you hear so much of it in their, their music. So we're going to gloss over a few years. How did, uh, how did Avalon come about? Um, well, once again, I think it was something to do with Atlantic Records because they, they, they were on Atlantic and they had a song on, this, on their album Manifesto, they had a song called Dance Away. Mm -hmm. And they thought it could be a single and Atlantic felt it could be a single. And so they, they had me mix it. And it was a funny thing because they sent Ahmet Erdogan, who was pretty much, I guess he was like the president of the label. I'm not sure what his title was, but he was a big shot at, at uh, Atlantic. He came over to mix it with me because the, the band was still in England. And so I'm mixing and he comes in. And, and originally that song was, was an intro, a verse, a chorus, a verse, and then went into the bridge. And so there wasn't a second chorus. And so Amit's like Mr. Hit guy. He's going, Where, where's the second? There's no second chorus in that thing. You, you got to put a second chorus. You got to do something about that. Can't you just chop in a chorus? And I go, well, geez, really? <laughs> okay. And of course, Without the not, band there, yeah. We're not in Pro Tools. We're, yep. Obviously, there's no Pro Tools. It's mm -hmm. just quarter-inch tape. Yep. I don't think we were even on half-inch yet. It might have been half-inch. I don't know. But... Um, um, I said, well, okay, let me see what I can do. So I, I, didn't, I went back and remixed the, the first chorus again on a piece of tape and chopped it in there and worked pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but it, isn't it beautiful the way, because the, the original format mm -hmm. of it was magnificent. It mm -hmm. worked so well. Yep. And I thought, well, why would we want to do that? And then, then you play it back and you go, oh, okay, I get this now. Yeah. And sure enough, that that made it a hit. He was right. You know, he wasn't he wasn't Ahmet Erdogan for nothing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, 
and we had to add, uh, I think I had um, somebody, I had a drummer come in and add a bass drum because it didn't have a consistent bass drum. And so to make it more of a dance kind of thing, we needed like f fours on the right. bass drum. Um, so, yeah, we, that was the other thing that we, that, that's something that I, I thought would be a good idea and they let me do, you know. It worked. Yeah. It's fantastic. So. And so how, so obviously they hear this, they're like, this is great, we want to work with this guy. Was it this? Yeah, and so then, then there were, the, the next album was Flesh and Blood mm -hmm. and they came over and, and uh, I mixed that for them on the console that I bought. The, and the, the original console from Power Station Studio A is at our studio at Apogee now. And so I mixed it with no automation or anything, just manually in the old days. And uh, and so that was a beautiful record as well. That's a really beautiful, nice yeah. album. And then and then they did Avalon, and uh, that was that, you know. <laughs> and it's uh, more people have commented on that uh, that record than probably just about anything else I've ever been involved with, you know. I think it sort of I don't know how to explain it. I just remember when it first came on the radio. I can't think of a more, like, of the time record. Mm -hmm. You know, it just had a, it, it, it just had such a unique sound. It didn't sound like anything else at right. that time. There's like a couple of things that were like that. I remember when Sweet Dreams, the first time I ever heard that, with that, yeah. you're just like, what is this? This what is, is like alien music. Yeah. And then Avalon had that same thing. It just like, Whatever song you heard, it just sounded like it came, I suppose, you know, I can't think of, like, it was almost heavenly, the amount of ambience that was around mm. it. Was there anything that well, you could tell us that, about that? that really that live chamber. The live and, chamber. Yeah, and a lot of, you know, kind of a lot of the stuff that I've developed, I've put in this plug-in where, you know, I'd use delays, time, delays that are in time. Yep. And delays that would bounce back and forth or around the room and... And uh, it's very stereo. It's a very stereo record. Incredibly it's very stereo. wide. And, and very deep. You know, and you don't, a lot of the delays you don't really hear because they're in time and they're mixed in in such a way. They just kind of add this enhancement. It's like a, um, you know, it's just like a, a stage, you know, it's a, sort of this wider sound stage that I tried to get. And, and, uh, I mean, I don't know if I really thought about it that much. I mean, I don't really think about mixing very much. It's just whatever hits me, whatever, just stuff, you just know, I know, let me try this. And I'll, I'll try eight different things. One of them maybe will, oh, that, that works, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know what I, I thought the other day after, uh, after I saw you uh, last week, and I remembered Avalon, I remember that sort of visceral moment when the first time I heard it. I went back and listened to it with my older, more sophisticated ears. And you know what I really enjoyed about it? All the same things, all the ambience mm -hmm. and all of this and how like the hair stand in, like what a unique sounding record. And I listened to the drums, I'm like, that's, that's a real drum kit. That's right, yeah. You, you know a, what I mean? In those Andy days, Newmark. yeah, but, it's, but you understand what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. I'd almost imagined in my mind that it was more synthetic than that because it was the 80s. Oh, right, yeah, sure. And, and it was a beautiful thing because now it's, it stands the test of time because of that. Because no, it doesn't right. go, hey, this is the drum sound we're using this week, which a lot of, unfortunately, yeah. 80s stuff does. Yeah. You know, and, and probably even to this day, you know, where you get so, people can get so, like, here's the sound that, you know. No, real drums. Real, and it's got feel and groove. Yeah. And, and, and that was one of those things, too, that it's amazing how well it works because they, re they made, I mean, Rhett Davis and... Uh, and the band recorded the album with a with a drum machine, it, and uh, I don't know what there was, was a Lin. I don't know what what they used, but they created this, the songs not hearing those drums. Wow! And, uh, and the last thing, I think the week, a couple of weeks before we mixed it, they came in and we recorded Andy Newmark, and uh, the percussionist who uh, passed away years ago, uh, his name I've also forgot. And so there's a lot of incredible percussion on that record Lenny? too. Uh, no, it wasn't Lenny Castro. It was a uh, uh, 
jeez, I can't believe it. He was really incredible and just a great guy, too. And hopefully somebody out there will remember <laughs> what his name is. But was. Annie Newmark. But you just, you just look at the, I mean, it's, he's, got an, uh, he's got a credit mm -hmm. on the record, so. That's amazing. He'd be in uh, AMG. Um, but Andy was great. And he was the drummer for, uh, I think he did the bass drum on um, Dance Away, too, I'm pretty sure. Not positive. Was that decision that. made, was it, was it always going to be live drums? Or was that decision made late on as you're about I to think, mix it? I think they were planning on, I, actually, I don't know. You'd have to ask Rhett right. or Brian. Um, but I think that's what they were planning on doing. And, uh, you know, I mean, Andy was amazing. He oh, was, so you know, he played with um, Fresh. Sly. Yeah, he's the drummer on Fresh. Yeah, yeah. that Good too, time. yeah, right. And, and uh, yes, yeah, Sly, and then, of course, with, with Jack on Double Fantasy. Yeah, that's right, mm -hmm. yeah. Just an incredible talent. It, 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 insane drummer. And it just sounds like the band's following him. I mean, to, for a drummer to be able to do, to come in and overdub yeah. and make it sound like mm -hmm. he was there from the start, uh, that's that's not easy to do and you got to have a certain talent to do that. I also felt he's he's sort of almost honor, honorary English as well, honorary British. He seems yeah. to be able to work really well with with British artists. He has sure. such a great resume with that as well. Well, uh, he's from halfway in between. He's from Bermuda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably why. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he seemed to he, he's and Jim Keltner I feel very similarly oh, about yeah. these drummers that can be uniquely American, but right. also when they're playing with British artists, they make Indeed, sense. Very British, yeah. Yeah, right. and they, both those guys are. That's right. Well, so that's, yeah. that's one of the nicest thing about this job. Unfortunately, now that I'm just mixing, I don't get to work with a lot of these incredible musicians. That's the, that's the down part about, downside of Do you want to? Um, I do, except that I just like the mixing part better than right. recording. Right. And, I, and if I was a producer, yeah, I would. I would probably rather do that, but I'm a crap producer, I think. And so <laughs> your resume doesn't say that. But <laughs> well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm that good, and I wasn't ever particularly comfortable doing it. And I'm much more comfortable. I was always the guy uh, that you know. I'd be producing a record, and I'd be like, at the end of the day, anybody want a nice rough mix? I could do a nice rough mix. Right. No, that's okay. You don't have to. No, really, you just let me do a rough mix, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd be like all day, like dying to, to do a mix. Yeah. <laughs> It's a little, I guess, traditionally it's a more of a high profile part of the thing. But, but I, I, I actually am, you know, you were talking about um, being one of the first actual mixers. You, know, you that, yes, you yeah. being one of the first actual mixers. Well, you know, uh, it was interesting realizing that people were just hiring me just to mix records because mm -hmm. that, that seemed odd to me at the time. I said... Really, you just want me to mix your record? Oh, okay. And then, uh, you know, I did a bunch of them. And then my manager at the time, a guy named Dan Crew, who was a very insightful person, um, he said, you know, I could get, I could probably get you a point for, for that. No, nobody's going to pay a point for a mix. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you insane? It's not, no, I, I think I could do that. I, th I think that can happen because a lot of people are coming to you specifically for the mix. Yeah, knock yourself out, pal. And sure enough... You know, it's get, I started getting points, and now, of course, then everybody started getting points. So, so you, you made a lot of people a lot of money. There you go. So Chris and Tom and Jack and and all these guys, and they they owe me they owe me royalties. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, just kidding. commission fifteen percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's my Where's Dan's commission? He should yeah. be getting it, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's amazing. Um, yeah, Jack. It was Jack Douglas who 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 told me that story and of uh, him being in with Aerosmith in one room and Bruce Springsteen being right. in another room. Mm -hmm. And he said, you were upstairs? I don't know if that was just a... If it was... Well, it could have been in either place, actually, because it was a mix room upstairs at Head Factory. And, and Power Station, I was usually up in the SSL room, which is Studio C, upstairs. Right. So it could have been, could have been Power Station. I usually wasn't... I'd come in and I'd do, go head upstairs and I usually wasn't very aware of what was going on downstairs. So the two main rooms, B and A, were downstairs. And I'd always be up there mixing. Yeah, Jack told me this story. He's, he's in making an Aerosmith record, They're making a Bruce Springsteen record. It's a little behind. And like, yeah, yeah, Bob started mixing the record while they were still finishing up the album. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that would happen. That would happen a lot. 
Yeah. And so in Jack's mind, he was like, that's, that was like the birth of the professional mixer. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, it helped the, the, the album come out in time. You know? Yeah, well, a Avalon was like that because they were doing vocals. I mean, Brian would always, that would always be the last thing he would do would be the vocal because he would just wait for the, to write the lyrics for the last minute. And, uh, and they were in Studio A recording vocals while I was, I was mixing in, in Studio C. That's true it's for that as well. So, yeah, that happened quite a bit. You know, happens now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But it also makes sense. I mean, from what I love about Roxy Music is the career. I mean, you've got them with Eno. Yeah. You've got them this sort of crazy art rock right. sort of just insane art rock band with Pajama Rama, yeah. Love is a Drug. Yeah. You know, pop songs like that, Pajama Rama, which is, in, yeah. and then just insane art stuff they did. And then they matured into this band which you know is especially with that album is like a stamp of what what was great about the 80s right yeah you know it's like a, so there they are they're, they're this art house 70s rock band from from britain and mm -hmm. yeah it's uh i i, I i'm a, just a huge fan but i love careers i love looking at artists as they develop so mm -hmm. it's great to see that 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 became such a signature for them yeah no it was it was a good thing i you know, I, I liked Roxy Music. I wasn't a huge fan of Roxy Music. I didn't know that much about them. I don't know if I, that stuff in the 70s even came over here. Yeah, it did a little bit. I did a little bit, okay. A little bit. You Probably know, Love, Love is a Drug, is a drug yeah, was the main yeah. thing. Yeah. And I didn't know that much about them. And then uh, I got this message of, about mixing with them. And I remember I was working with a... I was producing a friend of mine, named <coughs> David Werner, this guy from Pittsburgh. And when I got the call... And uh, I said, yeah, you know, this band Roxy Music, a pretty interesting band. They want me to mix something. And he just turned to me because he was a big fan. And he was, dude, you should do that. <laughs> you know, yeah. don't, don't pass that one up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. So tell me a little bit about Tears for Fears because we just touched on it earlier about how <laughs> Woman in Chains is such a huge reference mix for so many of us. Well, it was interesting with them because uh, the first thing I mixed for them was the other big hit on that album, which is Sowing the Seeds. Huge song, yeah. And I spent, yeah. well, I spent a day setting up. It was huge. For the time, it was enormous. It was on two Mitsubishi machines, so it was 64 tracks. But it was, tracks were stacked, so there would be like three and four things, different things on each track. Um, and it was just massive thing. And uh, I spent a couple days mixing it. Roland came in and listened to what I'd put together and, and I said, what do you think? And he listens to it and he goes, you know, there's absolutely nothing about that mix that makes any sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, that's just, just this is what so you wanted to hear. completely wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> and, <laughs> You were like, hey. Uh, well, okay, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> you want to play cards? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He goes, well, I go, you want to point, try to point me in the right direction and let me see what I can do. I can, I'll do anything that you want, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he gave me some pointers, some tips. I said, okay, and so give, give me like an hour or so. And I played around with it and he went back and he goes, well, that's a little better, but uh, let's make something else. <laughs> right? That yeah. was it. He just, okay. <laughs> Because he, he, and it turned out, I realized when, when it came out, I realized what it was. Because when I heard it, it sounded like a Beatles record. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought, oh, I'll just mix this really dry and up front right. in your face. And if you listen to it, it's got quite a bit, bit of, it's not soaked in reverb, but it's sure. got a lot more effects in reverb than what I had. And so not, once it came out, I understood what. Right. What, but of course, in the meantime, he spent, um, I mixed a whole album in the time that it took him to mix just that song, to remix that song wow. after that. So, yeah. whatever. Um, but then he said, oh, let's mix this song called um, Year of the Knife, mm -hmm. right? So I mixed that and that went really well. And then he cut on another ending or something. It's actually two, there's two mixing credits on that because he used, I think, the last eight bars or something from, some, from uh, the producer's mix, I think. And... Um, 
And then he said, well, there's, there's another song that you should give it a, give a shot, and that's Woman in Chains. And that had uh, Phil Collins playing drums, but it was all chopped up and sequenced. So he, he used what Phil played, but every fill, I guess he had Phil Collins play a whole bunch of fills, and he'd, pick, he'd cut, them, cut, cut them up, he'd create fills, mm -hmm. and he did it all, I don't know how he did it, I think he did it in a sampler or something. I'm not sure, but it was, it was all spread out in a whole bunch of tracks. It was really, a, the way it was recorded was very unusual, if I remember. But when you put it all together, it all just sounded like a normal. You know, if you, once I got the balance exactly right, it's like, wow. Because you'd have, have the first part of the, a fill on one track and then another part of the fill on another track. You know what I mean? That kind of thing was all stacked, pieced together. And um, it was pretty brilliant, really. <laughs> it's easy to mix. I only spent, I, I think I only spent four hours, four or five hours on it, if I remember correctly, at Olympic, I think it was in, in Barnes. Um, but yeah, you know, there's not a lot of, a lot about that particular song. There's more about the, the, the best stories about women, about uh, sowing the seeds, I think. Right. right. Well, for Women in Chains, um, um, I, I, are you conscious? Because, you know, we were talking about, you know, how Kurt's voice is here. Mm -hmm. And then when the girl singer comes in, she seems to be sitting above. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot is to do with the timbre of the voice and all this kind of stuff, but, you know, it's... I'd have to go back and listen to it again. I almost want you to listen to it. Yeah, yeah, I will. I'll listen to it. <laughs> no, so I almost want you to sort of like yeah. listen to it here and see, see what it feels like here, because it, it's, 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 it's pretty much a seminal work for, for, for many of us. It's, like I say, not to exaggerate, but the, the, the space is really beautiful on it. Well, it's a beautiful arrangement. I mean, that's I the main it. thing. More, I think more so than the mix is his arrangement was fantastic and her voice is fantastic. And that um, kind of dictated what I did. Uh, I just heard that and it, that inspired me to whatever it is that I did for it. You know, that inspired me to do that. You know what it is for me? I can, I can articulate it. You know how when you you hear those records that are, are done with incredible musicians, seasoned musicians, live in a room, and they're always the Grammy Award winning records that we all love. And, yeah. You know, there's so much dynamics from the musicians, mm. and the mix and the record itself is just an incredible representation of these incredible players. Mm -hmm. Women in Chains is one of the songs that has that sort of feel without being... Do you know what I mean? It's definitely produced. It's definitely the choices that mm. were made. That's for sure, yeah. It, but, but it still has that feel, has feel of, yeah. of depth and width that is really hard to get when you're doing pop records. Right. You, you know exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. You print something, sure compressors hitting like this, everything comes up, yeah. and you're like, you haven't got a bunch of 55-year-old, been playing together for years, guys and girls, all interacting and doing it naturally. Right. There's something that's very special about that because it's so it it always challenges me when I listen to it because I think to myself, you know, I don't want everything to be quite so tight and so, so compressed and quite so perfect. I I need yeah, to. Yeah, you want it to sound human, right? You want it to sound like hum, human beings are. Yeah. Yeah. Performing. Right. I know. And so that's a that's a great reminder for me of like how do I pull back? Because you know, like wow, the vocal sounds really up front. I got to bring this forward, this forward, this forward, this forward, <laughs> this forward, and then suddenly it's. You know, everything's right, right. here. Yeah. And that is a refresher for me every time. Push it down. Oh, okay. Right. Everything's here now. You know, how do I... Yeah. Well, for me, you know, th th just generally, like, like I said, I have to go back and listen. To, I, don't, I don't remember specifically what I did there. But um, mixing is, is, you just can't focus on the details too much. And I think people do. And I, I've worked with people that, will sit there and focus on details for days on a mix. And, and after doing that for a couple of days, I'm done. I can't tell anymore. And you want to do, get something as quick as possible and listen to the songs. Set back. Like, I don't solo things a lot. I just solo to make sure everything is, that there's no, no problems. But most of the time, I have everything in. I always have the voice in. You know, so it's all about the song and the voice for me. 
and and everything's got to work around that and and it's it's the song listen to if if you're not feeling the song it's hard to do a good mix and even even bad songs you can put yourself even if it's a song you don't like you can make yourself like it you can you can di divorce yourself from your opinion and and go okay what what is it what's the thing here what's what's the dominant um thing that people should get out of this the, what's the narrative maybe i don't know sometimes the lyric is pointless but the very times sometimes there's a great melody or the, there's a great chord structure there's, if, if it's a there's usually something that you can grab onto and and just listen to that and and don't sweat the details too much i don't know no, I, I, I hear you 100%. It's a sort of general mixing advice. It's not yep. too specific, I know. But <laughs> no, that's, that's quite specific because it, it resonates really heavily. And, and I, I don't know, I mean, Eric and I have sat up, we sat up one, what, to four o'clock in the morning with the guy telling us that he heard this <laughs> in a vocal. Who cares, you know? <laughs> you know, I, we just carried on like removing things and yeah. hoping that that was one of the ones. You know? Right. <laughs> uh, um, you know, we, we, we've, all, we've all been in that place. Oh, yeah. you yeah. know. Um, Get out the isotope plugins. <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, we heard lots of things in a vocal that you hear, you know, you know stuff well, in that, people. But. Well, that's the thing, yeah. There's so <laughs> much. A lot, a lot of times I just want, would rather leave things in. I mean, there, I heard an interview with McCartney who was saying that there are mistakes that he purposely left in to a couple of the records, and you hear them. A couple of songs, or um, I don't know if he, I think it was in Emmerich's book that I, I read about that. But, yeah, know. something, I rem remember something like, they'd listen to a take and it was like absolutely perfect, except there was one like mistake, he'd be like, that's the one I like. Yeah, right. Know, something yeah. like that, yeah. And then David yeah. Bowie, he, he was unbelievable, because when we were doing Let's Dance, um, I remember it was recording Stevie Ray Vaughan's solo in China Girl, I think it was, where he wasn't quite sure when the, the guitar section ended and it went to a chord change at the end of the section and he kind of ended up on the wrong note that didn't fit with the chord and we both looked at because he was sitting right here in the control room not in this room but power station and we both looked at each other you know we both cringed right and he goes okay yeah let's fix that i go yeah okay and bowie jumped up he goes no 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 leave it just like that it's perfect okay <laughs> You know, who's going to argue with Bowie? <laughs> and it was pretty perfect. Yeah, I and he was right. Yeah, he was right. That that that, <clears throat> I, I, that was like a huge announcement to the world of like, check out this guitar player. Right. I remember every guitar player I knew went back and bought Stevie Ray Vaughan. I know. I didn't know who. I remember him, David, coming to me and saying, "Have you ever heard of this guy named Stevie Ray Vaughan?" I go, "Unfortunately, no. I I feel like I should. I should. No, I don't know who that is. Oh, I I ran into him." He was playing in a club in, in Austin, and I'm bringing him in to do some solos. Cool. And I just, Stevie and I hit, hit it off immediately. He was just such a great guy. Just a crazy, talented, incredibly talented player. And, uh, and what was great was, you know, he didn't bring in some crazy pedal board or rack of gear. He had a super reverb, um, a Strat, and a guitar chord. <laughs> Beautiful. Luckily, it was long enough to get from the control room out to the studio, and that was it. You know, and I put some room mics on it, on the um, just to get a bit of ambience. I love the ambience on that. Yeah, it's nice. That's yeah. just Studio C at Power Station. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what a beautiful idea you've got. We were just talking about Bowie yesterday, and how um, that was like the time that he first made some serious money. You know, mm. he'd had all these beautiful records that had done, you know, yeah. well. But that was like the... He wanted a yeah. hit record for a He change. wanted a hit record for a yeah. change, yeah. But he's got this very, like, of the time, modern sounding record, but he brings in a blues guitar player. Yeah, how about that? And, and, and it just worked. Yeah. And I remember, like, I, I was obsessed with that record. I was obsessed with Stevie Ray Vaughan and a huge Bowie fan. I remember buying Guitarist magazine, and they interviewed him about making that record. Yeah. And he's like, they're like, well, you know, what do you do when David Bowie calls you to come in and play on a huge pop record? 
And, and I remember this line really well. He goes, I just had to figure out which Freddie King riff had to fit where. <laughs> and I just remember reading that and <laughs> thinking funny. that was so beautiful That's that great. It wasn't like, it was his moment to talk about himself, yeah, and he talked he about Freddie King. Freddie King. Yeah. Know, that's the kind of guy he was. It was a really good lesson, I think. Brilliant. Yeah. Just, yeah. So what did it make me do? I went out and bought a bunch of Freddie King records. Yeah. It's like... Totally humble guy, you know what I mean? Completely yeah. humble, yeah. This is just a beautiful thing. I mean, yeah. like that, that's what keeps the world going, and that's what keeps great music being made. Yeah, yeah. I know. That's, that's pretty nice. Yeah. So, uh, I, being a huge Bowie fan, I've, I've been reluctant to sort of ask you about that because I didn't want to gush like a little kid. But for us, I think, for, you know, for so many of us, like he was the complete artist. Mm, for sure. You know, the fact that he was, you know, in his own right, you know, a songwriter, a musician, a, an artist of all levels from acting to, you know, to directing to, 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 to like, you know, art itself. Uh, it was great in The Elephant Man on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Incredible, incredible performance. I know, he was, he was amazing, you know. And, and sort of humble in a way too, you know. Uh, I don't know, he's just, just, just a great guy to work with. Spont sort of, it's weird, because in some ways he was spontaneous in that he kind of let me do anything I wanted. You know, I would come up with, you know, Let's Dance, it's got some crazy effects on it, I thought, no, no, he's not going to go for this. And he goes, yeah, man, that's cool. That's, that sounds great. <laughs> you know, that crazy delay on the yep. um, Niles guitar and the, and I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff on that. And, um, but then at the same time, he was very, um, things that he did were very thought out and calculated. Like, uh, I think it was Cat People. No, it was the, it was that song, that instrumental song. Uh, uh, once again, I'm, f titles f fail me. Uh, um, there was a song on the second side of the album. I'm and blanking now. That's terrible. Yeah. I'm blanking on a Bowie song. Are yeah. you getting this? Oh, my God. And, and he, would, <laughs> he goes, okay, there's a, I want you to put a, it was like a quarter note delay or an eighth yep. note delay or something, but I'm going to point to you where I want it. And it didn't make any sense to me where, he, you know, I go, yep. okay. And so I just turned it on wherever, wherever he pointed. And then, and then I heard it back and, and it's, it made some kind of mathematical sense and music, musical sense. And I always felt that way about the end of um, Ashes to Ashes, which is one of my favorite songs. Not just Bowie songs, but one of my favorite I songs, think period. I think it's one of the greatest vocal performances of oh, all it's time. unbelievable. I've used that song with more singers than any yeah. other song. Because when they're just sing, giving me the song and they're singing in time and yeah. in tune, I'm like, give me some freaking personality. I'm like, I don't know what you mean. I play Mash It to Ashes. Oh, yeah, that's... It's like four voices in the first minute. I know. It's you know, it's like, ground control, do you remember? Oh, no, don't say it's not true. Then the spoken word going on. And that thing, that round in the end that he does. Yeah. Right, where it's... <laughs> the, the melody is three times and the chords are four times or maybe it's right. the other way around, I forgot. But it, so the melody ends up at the, each, each time it's around, it's on yep. a different note. Yep. And <laughs> it's this sort of mathematical kind of funny thing that just works perfectly. Yep. You know, yep. he would just do that a lot. I love that, that kind of thing. It's almost like things that Bach would do. I, I, I don't know where he came from. He, he, when I, when I <laughs> saw the man who fell to earth as a kid, yeah. I was convinced <laughs> that from, really was he him. He came from another planet. Yeah, I, I, and to I this know. day, I could believe it. Yeah. yeah. The, the, what you were saying about the different voices, modern love. Yeah. Right? He comes yeah. in to sing modern love, and it was just him and me, and he, he didn't like to have anybody else around for some reason. He just wanted to engineer, and him. And uh, so he starts singing it, but he's... He's singing it in, in his the deep Anthony Newley voice. Yep. yep. Right. You know. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I shouldn't try to imitate Bowie. No, that's no, I understand. that's okay. But you know, and uh, so so we do a verse and a chorus, and he he stops me. He's out in the studio. He goes, just, "Hang on a sec. Just could just play that back for me." So he just stands there listening on his headphones. I play it back. He goes, uh, and he's, well, hang, "Give me a sec." He sits there and goes. Now let's do it, do it one more time. And then he sings in the, up the octave, yeah. shouting modern love voice. Yeah. Right? Completely different character. It's like somebody else walked into the room. Yeah. Like, who's that? 
All of a sudden, I got to adjust the mic preamp and everything because yeah. it's overloading. And he gets to the end of the, the, the chorus and stops and he goes, okay, play that back for me. He goes, yeah, all right, yeah, you just punch it from there. Right, not, don't, not let me get a good take of that. Right. Punch in right where I stopped and, and he finished the song and then, okay, let's just double it. And that was, that was it, man. we were done with it. <laughs> Unbelievable, it took like half hour maybe at the most, <laughs> maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Oh my hair's standing yeah. on it. It's, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, he was the alien. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just like, my jaw's on the faders, <laughs> you know? It's like pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, it was really, that's one of the high points of my life, I would have to say, working with that guy. You know? I, can, I can only imagine. Yeah. I, I, I saw, I only saw him live once. Uh -huh. On the last tour, and uh, <laughs> I, I said to the person I went with, you know, if he plays Life on Mars, I'm going to lose it. That's like, <laughs> he didn't play Life on Mars, uh -huh. strangely enough. But so I don't know if you went to that last tour. Did you? Did you go to the last tour? I didn't, unfortunately. That's it. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, yeah. we didn't know he was never going to yeah. tour again. He was right. only 49 or 50. I mean, who thought yeah. he would never tour again? And all the all the, it was at the pond in uh -huh. Anaheim. All the lights go out, and uh, this cartoon comes up yeah. of the band, and mm -hmm. you hear them all talking. And then the lights go back out, and you just hear. I burst into tears. <laughs> I stopped crying 20 minutes on, into the drive home on the way home. <laughs> oh my God. The whole show. It was just, it was like, uh, I knew I was a fan. But you go there and he played for like two and a half, three hours. Wow. He did three encores. Jeez. And on his last encore, he came out on the last encore and he goes, this is what we did when we were Ziggy and played the whole of side one of Ziggy Stardust. Really? It just felt completely impromptu. Wow. Like, oh, why would he do it? And that. it plays five years and you're just like, what is oh, going on? Wow. It was like so beautiful. But right. nothing could take away working. No, that's a whole. That was, that was pretty great. Yeah, pretty great. Yep, um, and you know, getting back to the humility side, I mean, that was the beauty of Bo, wasn't it? Is that he would find people to inspire them, and then he would bring them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he would quite often. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, we have really new well. wave, as far as I'm concerned, in England because of Bowie, mm. because Bowie coming along and going, oh, by the way, here's a band called The Velvet Underground, uh, and right, here's a guy yeah. called Lou Reed. Sure, yeah. I mean, every you know, new new wave and punk is New York and mm. Detroit. You know, yeah. it's Iggy and and Velvet Underground and, right. and, and, and Patti Smith and, and mm. all of those bands. And, and that's this, what... And this place. Yeah, CBGs. <laughs> I got to play there. Really? Got, yeah, oh, play great. there uh, 96. Ah. Uh, they sang at late, late 70s. I was there every weekend. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so that, that we owe our late, you know, mid-late 70s through mid-80s yeah, right. entirely to, sure. to New York. But essentially, through Bowie's eyes and Bowie's ears. Right. He was our, he was our inspiration and, and uh, along, but along with Roxy Music, I mean that stuff is very New York influenced, you know, that yeah. sort of art scene, probably with a bit of like the German kind of like synth bands like Kraftwerk and stuff yeah, sure. crept in as well, but I think between like the, the synth bands from Germany, the Kraut Rock as we used to call it, and, and the New York, you put that together and that's where you get our punk and Sp new wave. Speaking of uh, Brian Ferry and Roxy, you know, I just saw Brian just played at the Greek Theater oh, did. a few weeks ago. He's still amazing. He's got an incredible bands with Chris Spedding playing guitar. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, the, they're just, I mean, it was amazing. I was in tears. Yep. You know, and the front of house guy was outrageously good. It sounded so good. It was, I was like, I went up and congratulated him after and shook his hand. Because he all, you know, the little delay things that I did, because he did pretty much all of um, Avalon of the album, and he just nailed it. I mean, the, the band, everybody, the, the whole thing, just, it was so good, you know. So if, if he's still touring and if anybody hears this, you should go see that show. Cause I should have. It's outrageous. I've been trying to make a point to do that. I mean, you know, because. Every day I wake up and somebody's gone, and I'm just like, yeah. when anybody comes through, you have to <laughs> yeah, go. You want to see yeah, exactly. take my wife, take the kids, you yeah. know, like because 
you know, when are they going to see anything of that level right. ever again? I know. What, who's doing that now, you know? <laughs> Thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Um, fun for me as well. Oh, well, that, 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 that I appreciate This is a real blessing to pick your brain and... Mm. and um, I picked yours a bit too, which is great. Uh, in uh, between you, that probably not going to be in there, but yeah, <laughs> I got a some good stuff from you. A, li a little bit, but... Um, you know, it's you, you, you've been in, involved in so many records that mean a lot to so much, especially in the industry side. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the fact that you're saying people are always like mentioning Avalon, but mm -hmm. it's not just, you know, a, somebody in, in the public going, oh, yeah, I like that album. It's like industry people because we love, you know, how seminal that work is, how important it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then, of course, you know, for me, Tattoo You was a big one. And, right and anything Bowie, and then everything else in between. <laughs> so much great stuff. So thank you thank ever so much for, for that, for, for sharing all of those details. And uh, My pleasure, totally. Been a lot of fun. Great, thanks, me too. So please leave any comments and questions below. Have a marvelous time recording, mixing, and everything else, and we'll see you all again very soon.